talking about that and talking about the Mexican war and about this war and that war and all the wars in, in which the American people were deceived, well, people said, wow, you're putting down our country. No, not putting down our country. We're putting down these rascals who have run our country for too long. That's who we're putting down. Well, you, people are not making the distinction between country and government. People say, you're, you're being unpatriotic because you're criticizing the government. Be prepared for that, right? Unpatriotic. What is patriotism? Does patriotism mean support your government? No, that's the, that's the definition of patriotism in a totalitarian state. The definition of patriotism in a democracy is Mark Twain's definition of patriotism. He said, I'll support my government when it does right. I'll support my country all the time. The country and the government are not the same. When you hear a young fellow speaking into the microphone, he's going off to Iraq, and a reporter asked him, uh, why, young man, are you going? Why have you enlisted to, to fight for my country? Sorry, the man has been deceived. He's not fighting for his country. If he dies, he's not dying for his country. He's dying for Bush and Cheney. He's dying for the, you know, those corporations that are making huge sums of money in the war. That's the, you know, <laughs> Blackwater. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very important distinction between government and country. There's a distinction that if people really read and understood the Declaration of Independence, they, that they would really understand that distinction because the Declaration of Independence says governments are set up by the people. Governments are set up by the people to ensure certain rights. The governments are artificial creations. They're not, you know, <laughs> given by God. They're set up by the people to give the people certain rights to protect the equal right of everybody to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And according to the Declaration of Independence, when governments become destructive of these ends, and these are the words of the Declaration, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government. That's, yeah. The Declaration, the, de the Declaration is, Declaration of Independence is a manifesto for civil disobedience. Yeah, and that's what civil disobedience is. It's, you know, uh, the laws are made by the government. Some of the laws might be good. But when a law violates uh, the basic moral principles, or, or when the law protects in somehow the violation of those, most, those basic principles, then it is your duty as a citizen, as a person who believes in democracy, to violate that law and to stand up, not for the government, for the, but for the principles that the government is supposed to stand for. So, yeah, we have to think about basic principles in connection with war. Uh, and uh, have to think about the relationship between the government and the citizen. And um, my own attitudes towards war, I guess, came out of, well, two things. Came out of, well, my study of history uh, and my own experience in war. And I, uh, I, was a, I, I was in the Air Force in World War II not World War I, <laughs> World War II. Uh, I, and uh, I uh, dropped bombs on various cities in, in Europe, on Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and France. You know, I, was, I enlisted because you know, this was the good war. This is a war against fascism. And it's true you can make out a better case for World War II. Although now I don't believe there's such a thing as a good war or just war. Uh, but you could make out a better case for World War II than any other because, yeah, there is this terrible evil fascism and we must do something about it. And people didn't think, well, is this the only way to do something about it? Is, is killing 600,000 ordinary people in Germany through our bombing, killing 100,000 people in one night in Dresden, is killing several hundred thousand people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
is incarcerating 120,000 Japanese in our country, is engaging in a war that will kill 50 or 60 million people, is this the, poss the only possible way to resist fascism? Or is it that after something has happened, and this is an interesting phenomenon, after something has happened a certain way in history, it's very hard to imagine it happening any other way. Very hard to imagine another scenario. The thing that has happened, if it's happened in a certain way, it has a certain look of inevitability, of this is the only way. But if, if we are human beings with ingenuity and imagination, we have to begin thinking of different ways of solving problems than war. Because war, and this is the conclusion I came to only after the war. Because during the war, I was an eager bombardier. During the war, I dropped bombs on people who didn't think about it. I didn't, well, I didn't see people, you know, dropping bombs from 30,000 feet and, you know, uh, didn't see people, didn't see human beings dying, children, their limbs turned off, didn't see that. And so much of modern war has that aspect, you know. So much of modern war is killing people at a distance. The pilots come back from Iraq and, and happily say, a mission accomplished, you know. Did they know who they killed? With even, even the most sophisticated of bombing devices, do they really know who they killed? They don't. No way. Uh, uh, no war. The technology of war has reached the point, certainly ever since World War I, where war is indiscriminate killing of innocent people, and to a large extent children. And when war has become that, when war has become the indiscriminate killing of innocent people, then you mustn't engage in it, no matter what you're told, no matter what you're told about democracy and terrorism and this and that, no, because in your reaction to this, in your support of this, you will be supporting an atrocity. You will be supporting terrorism. War is terrorism. War is, this is an important thing to keep in mind when you think we're fighting against terrorists. War is terrorism. I see Bush as a terrorist. Seriously. I see, seriously. You know, if, you know, if, if, I mean, terrorism is the willingness to kill large numbers of people for some presumably good cause. That's what terrorists are about. And governments, and this is a troubling thought, governments are capable of far larger scale terrorism than uh, bands of terrorists like Al Qaeda or the IRA or, you know, who, PLO. I mean, they could, those terrorists can can do terrible things, but governments can do much more terrible things. Uh, so, yeah, we uh, need to think about war as something that cannot be acceptable anymore uh, for any reason. That's a conclusion I came to after the war, and after I looked at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And after I looked at missions that I'd been on, well, I had no idea what the, I was doing. And I began to think about certain things, certain ideas and certain principles. Of, and I, real, I began to think about how, how is it that people get inveigled into war? Uh, I recently uh, came across this uh, thing by um, I always claim I have something that I'm going to show you, you know. Uh, of course, I could make it up, and uh, you, you wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, well, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. You know, we, we who are great scholars, we love exact quotations, which doesn't mean much because they can be taken out of context. <laughs> but I'll paraphrase it for you. Uh, after World War II, Hermann Goering, remember Hermann Goering? Good guy. <laughs> Hitler's second in command. Uh, 
he and other Nazi leaders were uh, in prison in 